Well, welcome back everybody for session one of our conference today. I'm so excited that everybody is here with us. Um, we have broken our program into two sessions. Um, the first session is really looking at today and what's happening, what we've learned. And the second session has a bit of a feel about looking to tomorrow. Um, the lineup of speakers is just absolutely incredible. Our facilitator for the first session is Dr. Kim Gorgon, who you met briefly during the Q&A session with our keynote speaker. Dr. Kim Gorgon is uh, an amazing faculty member who loves her students and bends over backwards to make them reach their potential. But she's also just a thought leader in mental health. Um, she's a wonderful asset to the University of Denver COVID response team. She's a great friend and somebody that I look for uh, advice from. And so, Kim, I'm going to turn this session over to you and introduce our, our incredible lineup of speakers that we have. Thank you. Corrine, Dr. Legsfeld, thank you so much. And uh, my hope for everyone in the audience is that you uh, find yourself a support network that uh, looks just like that. So, Corrine, thank you for the lovely introduction. And speaking of amazing friends and colleagues, I hope you all also have the kind of amazing colleague who has an appointment at Harvard Medical School and is the world's leading researcher on interpersonal violence. So I'm so pleased to introduce my good friend and the world's leading researcher on interpersonal violence, particularly in the area of cognitive and neuroimaging brain related consequences, my good friend, Eve Valera. Eve, take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Kim. And thank you so much to your, for your invitation to be here and to the University of Denver. I'm super thrilled to be here. And honestly, so far, this has been really amazing. So um, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to get going. Oh, where are we? There we go. And let's see. So I am going to talk about a topic that most people don't really appreciate or like like to talk about. It's it's not something that people find fun, and um, but nonetheless, it's something that we need to address, and something that has been exacerbated during COVID. And so the title is "One Lockdown Is Dangerous: COVID-19 and Intimate Partner Violence." But I'm going to talk to you about more than just. Um, intimate partner violence. One of the focus is going to be on something that has been exacerbated even more during um, uh, COVID, and that is brain injuries in women who have experienced intimate partner violence, which I think has really been overlooked. And so, so what is IPV or intimate partner violence? Simply put, it's violence perpetrated by a current or former spouse, partner, significant other, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Okay. Some fun facts for IPV, and I say that very facetiously, is that it's the leading cause of homicide for women globally, which blows my mind. It's also the most common form of violence against women. So people who love you and are supposed to, you're supposed to love back are the most common type of person who's going to actually injure you if you're a woman. One in three women globally have, are estimated to experience in partner violence. And it's found across all socioeconomic boundaries. It's not just the poor people, it's, it's the rich people, it's not just the Latinos or the people of color, it's white people, it's Asian Americans, it's, it doesn't matter who you are, IPV is cross-cultural and cross socioeconomic boundaries. And unfortunately, 80-90% of violent abuse to women injures the head or neck. I've told you, I've heard of women telling me about the being stomped in the head with work boots, punched repeatedly in the head with fists, hit in the head with hammers. And I kid you not, I just saw an article this morning about a man who killed his wife with a hammer and stuffed her body in the refrigerator, in the freezer, I guess, for five years until he was finally discovered and hit in the head with baseball bats. So as you can imagine, these things might lead to brain injuries and a lot of them. Women are also strangled, which can be a form of acquired brain injury. My research suggests that literally tens of millions of women may be walking around with undetected, undiagnosed, repetitive, mild traumatic brain injuries. Okay, and so that's sort of my big push here. I mean, intimate partner violence during COVID has gotten worse, but I also want you to remember that brain injuries, which we know are super, super important, right, to understand, are also escalating here. Now, women are often trapped in dangerous and terrifying situations in partner violence. People think, oh, 
whatever, you know, they can get out. Why don't they just leave? If it's really that bad, they would just leave. There's no, you know, that's how could somebody possibly stay in a relationship where they're getting hit in the head with a baseball bat or they're getting stomped on or they're getting thrown off porches? Well, they're often trapped. There's other things as well, too. It's extremely complex. But this power and control wheel shows you abuse is about power and control. And abusers often have that like you wouldn't believe. They may isolate women. They may have economic control over women. And it goes for men and women as well. I don't have time to go into the the nuances there, but but I, I study women who are being abused. So that's why I say the terms women. But the bottom line is, it is not an easy situation to necessarily escape. And then what do we have? We have at the end of 2019, COVID. And what we see during COVID is that IPV basically presented with, with, with COVID, we have a clash of two pandemics, resulting in increased severity of abuse and likely increased numbers of IPV related TBIs. We don't really have the power to study the, the numbers of, 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 of IPV related TBIs yet, just because we were so bad at measuring this to begin with. But basically it means things have gotten worse. We know that economic stress and uncertainty typically raise tensions in the household. They're typically gonna lead to increased violence. Loss of jobs also going to really you know, it's going to relate to stress, obviously. But then people are home; they have nothing better to do but potentially hit their heads and the wives in the in the heads with something, or just they they can't they can't you know go out as much because they don't have money. So so again, tensions are going to rise. Partner violence is going to tend to go up. Fear of contracting the virus is going to keep people in the home. Right. And so and, and, and lockdowns are going to keep people in the home. So if we get to the COVID mitigation strategies, we have people who are so told you cannot go anywhere. You are now locked down with your survivor, with your abuser. So so basically we have abusers and survivors spending more time together in their homes. Women don't necessarily have a place to escape because shelters might be overburdened or or shelters are closed or they can't even get to the shelter because they're afraid or they don't want to get the virus by going to the shelter and they may not have a place to call for help. Before COVID, one of them may have gone to a job and there may have been a, a possibility of calling for help. But now that there's COVID, everyone's at home. You can't get away to find that time to the privacy to call, even if you're afraid for your life. And some people think, oh, it's just a five minute call. Of course you can do something, run the shower, whatever. No, this often takes a lot of processing and planning. Remember my statistics before, women are most likely to be murdered by whom? By their partners. And they're most likely to be you know, violated physically by their partners as well. So it's not that simple. So basically rates and severity of intimate partner violence have been increasing since COVID-19. IPV rates spiked globally. You can literally watch it across the globe as, the, as, the, as, as, as COVID went across the globe. You could see the articles, the news articles go up like, IPV rates spiking 300% here or escalating, you know, 10% here. In the beginning, there was actually a dip in some of cases or, or in, in, in terms of some of the shelters saying, oh, we haven't seen as many people come in. And that is probably because women couldn't get in or women couldn't find the time or the, the, the safety to call for help or they were afraid of contracting the virus. But I assure you overall, rates of in partner violence have gone up. Severity of violence has gone up, which builds on and supports what I was just saying, that, that the idea is that, you know, anecdotally we know we, we've seen severity going up just by talking to a number of people who work in shelters, et cetera. And there's also been a paper that showed that in the emergency department in a, in a hospital, the type of injuries that women were reporting or they're coming in with were much more severe than the past three years of injuries um, put together. And then homicide rates have escalated across the globe as well. A couple of examples of just the UK and Mexico, I saw um, really high rates of, of, of femicide. And so basically we have COVID effects and mitigation strategies reducing women's ability to escape the violence or leave the situation. And so this is creating obviously an immediate problem right now, which we really need to recognize. I only have 10 minutes, so I can't go into a lot of it, but, but not only now, you could say, well, hopefully COVID's almost over or lockdowns are over. Well, that's not true everywhere because lockdowns are still in place some places. Um, and, and, and historically, what we know is that heightened rates of domestic violence service demands are seen a year after the event of the crisis. So even if it were to end now, we can know that IPV is going to be a problem for some time to come. 
I want to sort of, you know, just give you this one story. There was, uh, because of COVID, there was a transport ban in Uganda. Personal stories, I think, are very powerful. So I just want to say this. And, and that meant that you couldn't, you couldn't use a vehicle unless you were, you were a special, you know, maybe the police or something like that. And basically what happened was police call, calls um, for domestic violence went up from 1,137 to 3,280 during the same period from 2019 to 2020. And then a woman's a legal agency had calls going up from 522% from the previous year. So someone said maybe domestic violence women or I, in women experience in requirement violence should get an exception to this. And the president of Uganda basically said that domestic violence is not life-threatening and should not be considered so during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're just dealing with a few things that are life-threatening. Childbirth, snake bite, heart attack, finish. What else is there? We're not dealing with problems. Somebody's drunk and has beaten his wife. No, no, no. And this is just one story. A woman came home after picking up medication for her, her for her children. Her husband picked up a sharp object, stabbed her in the right eye, and then beat her. And when she blacked out, he fled. Okay. So if it weren't for the neighbors that heard her screams, she might have died there. But they were able to carry her to the hospital because they couldn't drive her. It took them about an hour to carry her when it should have taken 20 minutes to get her there. But the bottom line is this is how minute partner violence is perceived often times. And this is one of the things that really needs to change. Now, COVID has exacerbated IPV and IPV severity, but IPV-related traumatic brain injury is largely being ignored. And that was the same with that case I just told you. They talked about her eye and other types of things, but clearly she blacked out, but no one once in that article mentioned the traumatic brain injury. And if we look at the literature, we see the same type of thing, IPV and COVID, gendered violence and COVID, um, TBI and COVID, you, know, you, get, you get reasonable number of studies. TBI, COVID and IPV, two results. And one of those was just published in a special issue that I was a co-editor on. So basically, in sum, I just want to say IPV-related brain injuries are likely escalating during COVID. IPV is definitely escalating during COVID, and it's, it's our job to recognize and intervene. And with given more time, I would love to give you ways for how we can do that. Thank you very much. Dr. Valera. That was an incredibly sobering reminder about the toll that the pandemic is taking in so many ways. And uh, and there's no one better to explain the full scope of this, the global impact uh, on women in particular than you. So thank you for sharing. A reminder to our audience to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll have our first three speakers together for a group Q&A after their three talks. I'm really pleased to announce my next colleague, uh, when you hear the statistics or you see a headline, uh, you hear people talk and say, uh, they say 30 to 50% of people have a clinically significant anxiety um, condition in response to the pandemic and are, their lives have become completely destabilized. The they in that sentence is my colleague, Dr. Lynn Bufka at the American Psychological Association. Uh, she's actually their media spokesperson. She oversees a lot of that research as the senior director of the Practice Transformation and Quality uh, Agency of APA. And we're so lucky to have her here joining us today to talk about the state of mental health in the country uh, as if we had to wonder, but Lynn can uh, quantify that for us and uh, will be equally sobering to each talk. So Lynn, thank you. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to make sure I properly share my screen and then we'll get going here. It's always the challenge, right? How to how to do that. And of course, where'd the screen share go? There we go. So thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, actually, I already advanced. Um, I'm going to be talking about stress. We all know what stress is. Stress itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but how we manage it contributes to our overall well-being. And if it becomes a chronic aspect of our lives, we're definitely going to have negative consequences. And uncertainty, the political challenges, racial reckoning, wildfires and natural disasters have all been huge stressors for us in the past few years. But of course, we've had the pandemic, which is something none of us have ever faced in our lifetimes, which has been a significant source of stress for pretty much everybody around the world. And how we're managing it has really contributed to how we're functioning. 
Each year, the American Psychological Association surveys people across the country about stress, about sources of stress, how they're responding to stress, the intensity of the stress that they're experiencing, uh, what's happening with them both physically and mentally. We've been doing this since 2007. Our surveys are cross-sectional, not longitudinal, I wanna point that out, but they are representative of the national population. So we collect survey data every uh, late summer, uh, since 2007, and also during the pandemic, we did three additional pulse surveys in the first year of the pandemic, a March 2021 anniversary survey. We're about to conduct a second anniversary survey. So we've got a lot of information about how people tell us they're responding right now and what ben, that's going to mean. Yeah. I'm just jumping in to say we can't see your PowerPoint. Oh. Uh, well, just to do a quick pivot. Yeah. There we go. Now, that's can you it. see it? Done. Perfect. Got yeah. it. Sorry about that. So you didn't miss any graphs yet. So that's good. I had it all lined up and forgot to click the share. So um, my tech fail for the day. So I'm going to, there's two graphs on this page right here. Look at the lower graph. The red line shows us what people have said is their average level of stress for the past month when we've asked them this since 2007. And the blue line is people's perceived healthy level of stress. That red line is, uh, you'll notice it's dropped a lot since 2007. 2007 was the Great Recession. We know that the economy, money, work are significant sources of stress for people. And since we've moved out of the recession, people's average level of stress has declined. Notice that uptick in May 2020. That's when we are start, at the start of the pandemic, very stressful, difficult times for everybody, many places in lockdowns. Uh, so that was sort of the uptick. We've sort of stabilized with an average level of stress, a little bit higher than where we'd been prior to the pandemic, but also higher than what people say is a healthy level of stress. The upper graph is where I think it becomes really interesting. I took out the lines on that show gender and race differences in terms of self-reported stress. You can go to APA's website, type in stress in America and find and play around with the graphics and pull that up. But I wanted to point out the differences that we see for individuals in terms of across age groups and that older adults are not reporting the same level of stress as people who are considered Gen X and younger. So people in their 50s and younger than that are reporting significantly higher amounts of stress than their older counterparts. And there's probably numerous reasons for this. Part has to do with the way the pandemic has impacted people's lives, as well as the fact that as we get older, we have learned to sort of deal with stress in some different ways. We have some perspective on what is stressful and how we're gonna cope with life. So that's probably two of the differences, but I pointed out because I want us to be particularly cognizant of sort of the younger to middle-aged adults and what's happening to this large number of the population right now in terms of how they're handling stress. Our first anniversary survey in March, 2021, people were telling us they're using a lot of unhealthy coping behaviors in response to stress, whether uh, it's eating more or forgetting to eat has resulted in weight changes. People are drinking more alcohol to cope with stress, less physically active, the sleep changes and it's particularly essential workers and parents at that time who are telling us they were having the most behavior changes and the most challenges with handling stress. It doesn't surprise us, but it was certainly the groups that we really want to pay attention to. And by parents, we're meaning anybody with a child under the age of 18 at home. So for those of us who have adult kids, we're not in the parent group at this point. It's for those who have children at home. These data are pretty startling about weight changes. 60% of our respondents told us they had an undesired weight change in the first year of the pandemic. About a third reported undesired weight loss and two thirds reported undesired weight gain. And you can see pretty remarkable amounts of weight loss or weight gain in these individuals. So clearly we're either not eating or we're eating to manage stress in ways that aren't healthy for us that's having an impact on our weight. But we're also having uh, behavior changes in lots of other arenas as well. Uh, the majority of adults told us that they're having, 59% um, told us behavior changes as a result of stress in the past month. 
Sometimes it's avoiding social situations or altering their eating habits or procrastinating or neglecting responsibilities. And again, we're seeing significantly more individuals in the younger age cohorts telling us this and parents who are telling us this, that they're the ones who are really experiencing a lot of challenges in managing their stress. It even includes people are delaying or canceling healthcare services. Uh, people not being physically active. So lots of behavior change as a result of how people are responding to the stress of the pandemic. So we started to wonder what's going on cognitively. How are people handling, handling it mentally? We asked the question of how is decision-making going? 32% of adults in our most recent survey, and this was conducted in August, told us that they feel so stressed right now with everything they're dealing with with the pandemic that they're not making basic decisions easily, having a hard time figuring out what to have for a meal. And again, we're seeing this in the younger cohorts. So what's going on? Why is stress affecting people this way? And it has a lot to do with the constant need for risk assessment, the upended routines creates a huge cognitive burden for us that it's just very hard to manage all of that when we're trying to figure out, is it safe to go to the store today? Is this a mask wearing day or not? And if you have children, that's a particularly extra level of stress that you're contending with because you're also responsible for these little people or not so little people in the case of teenagers and some of the decisions you may be having to make for them. Uh, so that's really impacting how people are functioning in the world and how they're responding to the stress of the pandemic around them. And this is from the data that we've been collecting over the course of the pandemic with annual and, and pulse polls coming up with just asking people what's happening in terms of stress. Most of our data has been with adults, but we really need to pay attention to children and adolescents as well. Pre-pandemic data tell us that we've already been seeing an increase in suicidal behaviors among youth. 7.7 .7 million youth had a behavioral health diagnosis, but only half were getting treatment at that point and don't even but I won't even start on whether or not that was the appropriate treatment for the kinds of concerns that they were presenting with. So we were having a mental health crisis among our youth in terms of adequate care and meeting their needs pre-pandemic. When we surveyed youth in August of 2020, 13 to 17 year olds participated in the Stress in America survey at that time, half of them told us that their plans for the future felt disrupted. It felt impossible to think about what was gonna happen next. 80%, 81%, told us that virtual school, remote school was having a negative impact on them. They had less motivation, less engagement, difficulty concentrating. You know, and of course, think about it. What are adolescents' jobs at that point? Their job is to developmentally begin to separate from their family of origin, to build greater bonds with peers, to develop independence. Yet so much of that was being thwarted by inability to access peers, by more focused time at home, which certainly can have its benefits, but was also a challenge for some of the social developmental goals of where teenagers in particular uh, are at that point in their lives. And there's been international research going on, looking at the experience of depressive and anxiety symptoms. And we've seen that just double the report of that among youth. Our Surgeon General came out with a report telling us what their impact is, what their vision impact is. They're seeing the trends of how troubling it is for youth, children and youth and what's happening right now. Our Stress in America data fits in nicely with that because those age cohorts that are really struggling the most, that's the age in which parents are, right? So we know parents are really struggling. We know their kids are really struggling. Those are the groups that we're particularly concerned about in terms of the long-term impact of this particular period that we're in. So it's really a call to action. We need to be doing something at this point. I want to start by saying people are resilient. People adapt to so much adversity. And many people will probably get to wherever this other side is. And they'll be doing okay. But it's not going to be true for all. It's not going to be true for a substantial minority of individuals. We had problems pre-pandemic. But this should be a clarion call for us that we have to act differently moving forward. We, we can no longer say we're going to address those issues around access or adequate numbers of healthcare providers. We've got to start doing this now. We all have an obligation. The Surgeon General has made this clear. APA is focusing on this. Many organizations are saying mental health really needs to be a primary focus. 
So whether from a professional point of view or as individuals in our local areas, we need to be thinking about what's important for our communities. What are the barriers to accessing care? What is it that we can do to ensure that people have what they need to address the stressors and challenges going forward? So we've, you know, our first speaker just now talked about the interpersonal violence that's happening. What is it that we need to be able to respond to in our communities in order to keep women safe and to give them opportunities to thrive? What is it we need to do as our keynote speaker talked about in terms of addressing poverty? Because that's key in a factor in mental health for individuals as well. As psychologists, one of the things that we see is so important is to give youth and families the language and the ability to begin to recognize and manage their emotions, learn for their emotions so that they have a greater understanding of what's going on, develop some mastery of their emotional space and use that in ways that benefit them rather than causing them negative affective spirals. So there's a lot that we need to do uh, in terms of just how to promote a healthy psychological space for communities all around us and to begin to address the significant stressors that have become so clear as a result of this pandemic. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to the next speaker in this series. Dr. Bufka, Lynn, uh, I think you're one of the smartest people I know and I'm so proud to call you a colleague and to know you well enough to have extended the invite and uh, thank you for uh, the clarion call is so compelling, but to have those data crystallized I think is, um, uh, probably pretty stunning for audience members to realize the scope of the problem. I'm really excited to introduce our third in this first part of our series of session one. Uh, this is one of my favorite people in the world, our COVID coordinator, my colleague, Dr. Sarah Watamura. She has a day job in addition to overseeing the University of Denver's COVID response is also a professor and chair of our Department of Psychology here and one of the most preeminent childhood stress researchers. She is the co-director of the uh, Stress Early Experience and Development Lab or the Seed Lab. So uh, her uh, big picture view on COVID related inequities will be a really well informed view of community impact. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Kim, for the kind introduction and um, you know, I treasure you and I am excited to do this. Um, we have been uh, working hard on lots of aspects of COVID, but since the very beginning of um, this pandemic, because my research is on uh, stress and health uh, facing uh, for families facing significant adversity, I've had an eye toward um, the inequity piece of the COVID-19 pandemic and all the different ways that that has been manifest across time. And it's unfortunately going to be um, a textbook example of how um, inequity can impact not just um, individuals immediately, but uh, systems and uh, nations, and in this case, uh, the world. So I'm gonna give you a bird's eye view of that. Um, just as a starting place, uh, health inequities are differences in health statuses or the distribution of health resources between different population groups that, are, uh, that arise from social conditions and are both unfair and preventable. So you often see images like the one on the top uh, right here that depict um, individuals, for example, in this case, being able to reach apples because uh, they have a taller platform to stand on. And that taller platform to stand on is built up from uh, systems and generations of inequity um, in things like power, income, wealth distribution, um, and all types of access factors. So um, that can uh, really exacerbate a number of aspects um, and in this particular case with COVID-19, we can talk about how inequities have impacted exposure. So uh, even in the very early days of the pandemic, who were the individuals that needed to um, work in person in order to have an income uh, versus uh, people who were able to work remotely? Um, access to things like uh, testing, healthcare, vaccination, um, information, 
all of those kinds of access factors, um, and then inequities in things like cases, hospitalization, serious outcomes, and death. And then across time, across all of um, essentially all of 2021 and into 2022, we've been watching uh, vaccine uh, equity and inequity um, as it has rolled out. And um, had our various roles to play in that. So one thing I think that's really important and interesting is that um, time is a really important factor here when we think about inequity in this space and in any space. Um, we have actually seen some things very, uh, very dramatically shift across time. And in fact, when I suggested this topic for this panel, um, we were in a different place in terms of um, equitable access and outcomes. And so some things have shifted in really interesting directions. I'm gonna give you a little bit of that shift um, information and kind of where we are now. So in terms of the types of data that is being tracked in the US in particular, and this is um, mostly available on uh, the Center for Disease Control website and the other couple of um, main places where people are tracking this type of information, some census data, um, primarily looking at things like race and ethnicity, age, education level, region in the country, um, health conditions, so uh, pre-existing health conditions and their impact on outcomes, um, and then living circumstances, that would be things like um, uh, how densely populated is the place where someone lives, what are the, what are the access uh, barriers where someone lives, and then factors like homelessness, or incarceration. Um, and then the intersection of these demographic factors. So I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that, but uh, I do have an example of looking at how does age and race ethnicity interact in a way that um, influences outcomes. So if we just look at cases across time, and you can actually see the different variants playing out here, um, this is cases across time by race ethnicity. Um, you can see some consistent peaks. So um, about this time last year, the highest case rates were in individuals who identify as uh, uh, Latinx. And similarly, the same is true now. But um, if you look at the period of time where Delta was predominant, uh, you can see that uh, um, American Indian and Alaska Native folks had the highest case rates during that time. And there have been a couple other pockets of time where we've seen um, different uh, populations impacted more, uh, more severely by case rate. Um, and uh, just as a point that I made previously, case rates requires access to testing. So you have to be have some degree of access to testing to even know what your case rates are. And so access to testing is also something that differs by uh, race and ethnicity. Um, and then when we look at age groups, we've seen in the very beginning of the pandemic, so all the way on the left, you can see the 75 plus folks um, were making up a big chunk of those cases. You might remember back to the um, a nursing home and the, those kinds of uh, situations where we were seeing a lot of cases. Um, different things kind of playing out over time. This time last year, lots of cases in the, in the 18 to 29 year old folks, and we have that again now. So 18 to 29 and uh, 30 to 39 representing lots and lots of cases now with Delta and um, uh, this time last year, um, but some variation in that uh, across time. Um, when we look at age adjusted hospitalization rates by uh, race and ethnicity, so this is the intersection now of age and uh, race ethnicity, you can see the rate ratio, so the chance essentially of having um, a hospitalization by race and ethnicity within age. And I've just highlighted a couple of really important numbers for you. So if you look all the way to the right, um, for non-Hispanic white identifying individuals of all ages, the chance of having a hospitalization is sort of equal, right? It's all one. Um, the increase there to the left relative to that for non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Natives in the 18 to 49 year old age band, which is a relatively healthy age band, is a 5% increase. Um, three, uh, five, five fold increase, a uh, three fold increase for non-Hispanic black identifying individuals and a 3.2% uh, two, 3.2 factor increase for individuals identifying as Hispanic or Latinx. So you can see it there. If you wanna look at the um, impact of that on a population level, this graph shows cases per 100,000 individuals, and you can see how dramatically high that number is, um, particularly for individuals identifying as non-Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaskan Native. 
um, really uh, high number there in terms of the case rates per 100,000, highly impacted by that. In this particular graph and in a lot of this information on the CDC, uh, Pacific Islanders are grouped with um, other uh, Asian groups and those two demographic factors have um, sometimes quite substantially different um, outcomes. So that's just something to keep an eye on. Um, this uh, graph illustrates eight specific differences um, for death rates um, by race and ethnicity. And if to make it easy for you to understand this, the zero line would be sort of no increase or decrease relative to your population percentage. So numbers above zero are increased chance of death relative to your percentage of the population and below the line would be decreased than what would be expected for your percentage of the population. So all, uh, all, mostly all the way to the right there, non-Hispanic white folks, uh, much less likely to die from COVID-19 than would be expected for their uh, percent of the population. Whereas individuals identifying as Hispanic or Latinx or non-Hispanic black are at increased, dramatically increased rates of death from COVID um, relative to their percentage of the population. So huge disparity there that is of course of the most impactful variety. Um, when we look at uh, vaccination, so we've talked, our, our keynote speaker talked about vaccination and, and how that plays in here. Um, and we all see this in the news all the time. Vaccination is having a big impact on hospitalization rates. You can see here with every variant and um, you know, with the most recent Omicron surge, you can see the, the huge uh, gap between those who have been uh, fully vaccinated and those who are not in terms of the, uh, whether they are hospitalized. Um, and just taking the month of December as an example, so as a reminder, the month of December hospitalizations would be Delta cases because Delta um, came to the US in December, so those hospitalizations are, are in January. But this is just looking at December, 16 uh, times more likely for unvaccinated adults to be, um, to be hospitalized from COVID as compared to vaccinated adults. And that ranging from nine times more likely in 12 to 17 year olds to uh, 17 times more likely in adults 65 years or older. So um, just to take a snapshot in time, huge uh, increase in the likelihood of, of that outcome. Um, so one thing that's really interesting though is the uh, percent of folks who've been, who are vaccinated has changed across time. So in uh, by group. So in June of 2021, and there was a lot of effort and outreach um, put toward this, um, and you probably remember this, there was a lot of focus on, okay, unvaccinated adults are younger, less educated, and uh, more likely to be people of color. So um, that was the case. That was true in June of um, 2021. Some of this uh, try to, trying to disambiguate um, factors that can co-occur. So um, race, ethnicity, intersection with education, for example. Um, and actually, even in June of 2021, education was the biggest driver. So um, individuals with less formal education being less likely to be vaccinated was true in June and continues to be true now. But the race ethnicity uh, differences have changed quite dramatically. So now among those who are unvaccinated, 65% of those folks are identify as white, whereas 61% of the population identifies as white. So a higher proportion, it's like a flip, a higher proportion of those who are unvaccinated now are identify as white than make up the population. Um, and then if you look at vaccination frequency, so being vaccinated in the last 14 days, not only proportionately are individuals who identify as Hispanic more likely to be, um, have had at least one dose of the vaccine up until this point, but they're also much more likely to have done that in the last 14 days. So that disparity by race ethnicity has really shifted. Um, and now, um, as was true in June, 2021, uh, education continues to be a huge driver um, but that education and uh, race ethnicity intersection has really um, disambiguated. When we uh, look into why people are not vaccinated, um, the factors make sense when you think about this education frame. So concerned about possible side effects, um, not trusting COVID-19 uh, vaccines, not trusting the government, don't believe I need a vaccine. So a lot of factors that intersect with education. Um, looking globally, um, 10 uh, billion people and counting have been vaccinated against COVID-19, which is incredible from a scientific perspective. Just pause and appreciate the amazing lift that has taken our, 
our scientific communities. Um, and 27.6 million are administered daily. So really phenomenal. But what you can see here is the, uh, the global inequity um, where we have 6.3% of population, 6.3% uh, of the, le uh, the 50 least wealthy places in the world, um, making up 6.3% of the vaccinations. So um, we have enormous uh, vaccine distribution uh, inequities globally continuing. Um, so, and then with respect to vulnerable populations, there are a number of populations who are at much higher risk of negative outcomes if they uh, have COVID-19. And I've highlighted in yellow uh, conditions that are also known to be highly influenced by other social determinants of health, uh, like housing, healthcare access, prior um, adversity. So um, there's an intersection there as well that I think is really important to, to take into consideration and also populations uh, at risk by their living conditions like incarceration or homelessness. So take home message here, um, inequities are not inevitable by their definition, a health inequity is, a, is an unfair and changeable factor. They're also not static. So in this case with COVID-19, we've seen this dramatic change from June to January. Um, and that's, I think, a really important lesson for us. Um, inequities do impact everyone eventually. So um, by not having global distribution of vaccines, we continue to have variants that um, impact all of us. Um, things that cause uh, the healthcare system to be overwhelmed, for example, um, by individuals who are primarily unvaccinated, impact the way everyone lives and works, um, impact our uh, availability of resources and labor, uh, labor market factors. So increasing equity is the right thing to do, but it's also the effective thing to do to reduce the impact of COVID-19 and other uh, serious um, global conditions on all of us. And I will stop there. Dr. Watamura, oh my God, uh, I, I feel like uh, my brain is almost uh, hurting at this point. I see myself in so much of that and just realizing the, the state of the globe is, uh, is really sobering. And I'm excited to have a few minutes here for Q&A. Uh, we may never have this big a group of collective brain power on behavioral health available to us again. So uh, Evelyn and Sarah, we're going to open this. I think Kareen has the first of uh, a few quick questions from audience members and we'll start there. And then we'll roll out. I wanna invite our audience members to, to break as you need to. We're gonna keep our schedule and roll out at two o'clock with our colleague, Dr. Ginny Taby. Uh, well, that was absolutely wonderful. Those three speeches were really just putting it home for all of us. Uh, my first question really is uh, to Lynn. I just am really, really astounded for the differences in what we see between Gen X, or excuse me, Gen Z and millennials and the rest of us. Um, could you just maybe, take two seconds or 30 seconds and comment on uh, how can we close that gap? Like that just seems uh, unreasonable to allow to, to continue to uh, deviate from the rest of society. And I would wonder what your quick thoughts would be. And I think part of the challenge is when you're thinking about, about that age generation, right? They're really squeezed with trying to figure out how to manage both what they're facing in terms of dealing with the world and their kids. So we've got to build up supports for schools and where kids are in order to ease a little pressure from parents, whatever that's going to involve. And when you think about Gen Z, you know, these people, some of them are barely adults, right? This is like, I never dealt with anything like this when I was just figuring out how to write a rent check. And so you're talking about a group of individuals who just don't even really have the skills, all the adult skills you know, for managing. And so I think the more that we in whatever positions we're in can figure out how to either give some grace or allowances to folks in those situations. Uh, and then also on a, on a system wide level to address the demands that people are facing, whether it's uh, flex hours with work so people can manage their home and work demands, whether it's providing more supports for emerging adults as they figure out how to just do this adult thing in a world where the rules change all the time. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there that are, are brand new and we've got to think differently than we have before. 
Oh, thank you so much. That really actually sets up our next session where we have a speaker talking about um, more childhood education type uh, activities. My next question is for Eve. You really ended your talk with the perfect question for yourself. And so I'm going to give you that time to talk about what can we do to improve things in regards to TBI and COVID in general. Yeah, so you know, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, <laughs> to address that somewhat. So, it, I mean, it's one of the things that we can do is is really, I mean, it depends on all of what you're talking about, but just as an everyday person is really to open up the conversation about intimate partner violence, because partner violence is very stigmatizing. Nobody really wants to admit that it's going on and people don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. And I don't want to ask my neighbor if they're safe, even though I hear yelling because maybe they'll get offended. And so there's all these stigmas associated with this but there shouldn't be. And, and, and I'll just a quick example, like if someone, if I were in a bar or, or, or somewhere and somebody hit me over the head with a bottle, I would tell people, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this person hit me over the head with a bottle. Maybe you'd go to the doctors, whatever. But you know, if you're in your home and your partner hits you over the head with a bottle, you're like, uh, you may not tell anybody. You don't want to tell anybody, it's embarrassing. And so it goes hidden. And, and so intimate partner violence is very underappreciated. It's very hidden. And the extreme abuses that, that people experience are really um, largely, I mean, just ignored and underappreciated because of that. And so just reaching out and you could say, you know, in COVID people are much more stressed out. I know homes have gotten, you know, less safe because people don't know how to relieve their stresses. Are you safe? So something as simple as that, reaching out and, and allowing them the opportunity to say, well, actually there are issues, will be something that will help at least raise awareness about IPV. Um, and then, you know, if, if you get any further than that, you can ask about, you know, if their head's been hit or something and you don't have to diagnose head injuries, but just knowing, you know, people know about concussions from athletics, people know about concussions from the military. And, and sure, those people are experiencing lots of concussions, but by my, by my data, if I can extrapolate, and we don't have you know, the best data to do this, way more women are sustaining repetitive brain injuries than our um, football players, et cetera, um, and, and folks from military. So we really need to be thinking of partner violence and brain injuries in the same sentence, basically, and really raising awareness about the whole thing globally. Thank oh, you. That last statistic is just... Uh... Uh, jaw dropping. Thank you so much. I think right now we need to flip gears and we thank our three first panelists uh, for your incredible insights. I want to remind everybody that we will have these presentations available recorded, but we also are trying to get a portfolio site and put the presentation materials up for people to be able to see them and understand them and utilize the statistics and ways in their uh, personal venues, how they that best could be used. This conference is really uh, shared and open service. Thank you so much. Kim? Thanks, Green. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Uh, I am excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, in terms of our flow today, we have one additional talk, this with Dr. Tavey uh, on the impact of COVID. And then we're doing a little pivot mid-session one, which is to talk about uh, interventions and what's working and which of the systems that success appears to be having the greatest efficacy. So uh, there's a pivot ahead, but really importantly, I think this is the conversation that a lot of folks are having. It's certainly dominating the headlines. Uh, my colleague, Ginny Tavey oversees, she's the chief of neurology with our partners, National Jewish, and she oversees their long hauler post COVID clinic. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about uh, the actual experience of brain fog post COVID. Dr. Tavey, take it away. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Very good. So we've learned from hospitalization data that acute COVID-19 is complicated by neurologic issues in about just over a third of cases. And this ranges from loss of smell and taste to encephalitis in patients with severe disease. Unfortunately, this is not the case for long COVID, which is defined as persistent systems, symptoms three months or more after the acute infection. So you can see here, uh, this is a web-based survey involving nearly 4,000 patients in over 50 different countries um, of patients who you know, self-report and they, they've had infection. This is six months later, 80% still had one or more symptoms six months after the infection. Um, out of the 16 symptoms you see there, seven are neurologic with brain fog as the most common. 
and unfortunately the most disabling in many of our patients. Brain fog is real. We see it every single day. I've got a psychotherapist who used to lecture all over the world. Now she can't do her laundry because she can't figure out how to push the buttons to make the washer work. I have a FedEx corporate executive who flew all over to manage several hundred uh, uh, centers across the, the US and he doesn't know what day of the week it is. His wife has to keep all of his appointments and all of his timetables for him. Um, and of course we have numerous doctors and nurses who got sick and now they simply can't go back to work. What causes it? We don't know. For many months, we thought it was persistent infection, but we now know from uh, CSF studies, autopsy studies, they can't find the viral particles in patients with acute uh, COVID-19 in neurologic tissue or, or CSF. However, the current thought is ongoing low-grade inflammation that's happening just in the brain. There's a group at Yale led by Shelley Farhadian um, who have found what they call a cytokine signature. And this is an abnormal pattern of inflammatory proteins that they're just seeing in the spinal fluid and not in the serum. Clinically, what we're seeing is problems with attention, concentration, uh, memory. And it's, it's a big problem, you know, uh, especially with uh, families. Patients will say, you know, you'll get into your, your regular fight with your partner or your spouse, and they'll say, I told you this yesterday. And they'll say, no, you didn't. And in fact, they did, but they can't remember. Word finding is, is big. A lot of patients have difficulty articulating what they want to say. They just can't come up with the, the right series, the right pattern of words. I had a heating and cooling uh, repairman who almost got fired because he couldn't tell the client that the problem was with the thermostat. And I have even simpler problems. I have a patient who is a teacher and she can't think of words, you know, not, not like us where we think, ah, uh, you know, what's that word? Oh yeah, yeah. But she'll say, you know, that thing I put my cell phone and wallet in, that thing, it'll take her days to figure out she meant purse. Um, and aside from the inflammation, certainly mood disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, fatigue, chronic pain can all play a role in ongoing brain fog. When we do see patients, what we uh, order is a formal neuropsychological testing. And this is helpful for many reasons. It's an objective measure that patients can uh, see, their family can see there's something really wrong with them. And of course we can use it um, and, and measure it again in a year and two years. And then uh, it's also helpful for the workplace. We used to get brain MRI in, in a lot of our patients, but now, um, and you'll see going forward that it's normal in most patients. And then of course, speech evaluation for all the verbal processing issues. So my nurse practitioner and I have been seeing uh, post-COVID brain fog patients for just over, a, or just about a year, under a year actually. We've accumulated over 200 people with post-COVID-19 brain fog. The vast majority are female uh, with 75% almost being women. The mean and median age is 50 years old. And over half the patients still have smell and taste affected. I have a family practice doctor who smells rotting flesh all the time. Uh, one time she was so excited because she smelled her son's dirty feet, but then it just became rotting flesh again. And it's horrible. Um, an interesting point about these patients is that most of them have mild disease. You can see here, 75% did not require hospitalization and only 13 needed to be in the ICU. Of the patients we have MRI data on, 58 of 83 stone cold normal, uh, and this is with and without gadolinium. Uh, 23 had nonspecific or chronic changes, the most common of which is what we call nonspecific white matter changes. And you can see that in high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, um, migraines. So it's, it's hard to tie that in with the post-COVID symptoms. And then we picked up a few weird things, a pineal cyst the patient had known about for many years, a dot in the thalamus that we don't think is related at all. Uh, a cavernous malformation is just a venous malformation that the patient was probably born with. And the same thing goes for possible cortical dysplasia versus slow ganglioma. We did pick up a cerebellar metastatic tumor in a long-term smoker that was obviously unrelated. But there was one woman who was a nurse who we found multiple white matter lesions. And we don't know, could it have been from the COVID? Could she have had MS that predated the COVID? We don't know, and the workup is still pending for that. 
But I think that the take home message about MRI, 98% were normal or had chronic nonspecific changes that are likely unrelated. The MOCA, for those people who are not familiar, this is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's a 15 minute screening tool that you can do at the bedside. And it covers a number of domains like verbal memory and recall. Um, and it gives you a score. It's a 30 point scale, 26 to 30 is normal. The cutoff for abnormal is 25. And 18 to 25 is mild cognitive impairment. The dementia range starts at 17. The average score for our patients was abnormal. It was 25. And unfortunately, we had four people scoring in the dementia range with the lowest score in a 44-year-old woman who scored a 14. The youngest person to have a low score was a 35-year-old who scored 16. And just to put things into perspective, the cutoff for driving for many physicians is 18. So this is significant. Now, in contrast to the MOCA, uh, we did formal neuropsych testing also, which is a more in-depth three to four hour test where they're with the, a neuropsychologist, you know, verbal IQ is tested, uh, learning, memory, you know, all of that, attention, concentration. And for these patients, 70%, 78% had abnormalities in at least one cognitive domain. The most common abnormality was in memory, both short-term and visual memory. And this was seen in just over half the patients. But this was closely followed by deficits in attention, cognitive and verbal processing, and verbal fluency. These are all things you can see on the typical um, clinical visit. And the patients will tell you that as well. What we do for them is to try to get them supportive management. So we send them to cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, you can send them to a standalone place. Uh, sometimes to, um, TBI centers will allow patients to be seen there, traumatic brain injury. Um, I have one patient who goes to the cancer center because they have a lot of patients with chemo brain fog. He said that's really helped him. But the most helpful thing that we found among our patients is speech therapy with cognitive linguistics. And this really helps with um, verbal processing, word finding, even verbal memory. I can't overemphasize enough the importance of counseling and psychiatry. Mood disorders, um, depression, anxiety bloom if they're pre existing or they uh, start afterwards. And um, we take it very seriously. I have, uh, we had one patient who was waiting to see us, and maybe the week before she took her own life. So we get these patients to the help that they need as soon as we can. Social work can be helpful for them in that regard as well, but they also help point towards resources for disability paperwork, for financial assistance. Remember, a lot of these patients have to leave work for several months and some of them aren't able to go back. So this is very helpful. And of course, meditation, mind-body therapies. This helps them sleep. It helps them with coping mechanisms. And so we recommend, you know, trying a yoga Zoom class or Tai Chi uh, for the men patients. My male patients, I had one patient who, you know, he was the CEO of a big company. And he's like, I don't do Tai Chi, you know, I, I ski. And, you know, uh, six months later, he uh, teaches Tai Chi. So it, it does help. As, you, as I said before, we've been here for about uh, a year and we've had enough experience or enough time to see some patients in follow-up for six months. 46% did improve. They were able to go back to school, go back to work. Um, and as I said before, they uh, thought that the cognitive linguistics was one of the most helpful things. Whether or not the vaccine helps is, um, is still unknown. It's about 50%, 50-50. And I had a number of patients who tell me, oh my gosh, that Moderna gave me a bump in my memory. My family noticed, I noticed. And then I have another half of the patients telling me it destroyed any gain that I had. Regardless, we do recommend vaccines in all patients because the risk of worsening is uh, not as bad as the risk of getting it again and being sick. Um, but the, the striking abnormality is that 44% had no change they were still having ongoing brain fog. Um, but it's important to know that many things affect this. Uncontrolled headaches is one of the most common things that our patients have reported to us. Um, they tell us specifically, when, we have a when I have a headache, I can't concentrate, it makes everything worse. Anxiety, depression, a number of our patients have been reinfected with COVID, or if they have a pneumonia or another upper respiratory infection, it just sets them backwards. 
And as I said before, it's, it's unclear if a vaccination um, uh, makes it worse or better, but we always recommend vaccination. The best thing is uh, reassuring them and telling them cognitive linguistics works, telling them about success stories and letting them know that uh, we're on their side and time will only tell. So thank you for your uh, attention. Dr. Tavey, uh, Jeannie, thank you. Those, I say this as a neuropsychologist, those MOCA data are horrifying. And uh, wow, that is, uh, I think um, we've capped off the most sobering part of our content today with uh, a gut punch to everybody uh, listening and watching. But thank you for sharing some of the data. Uh, I did mention that the program at National Jewish is regarded to be one of the nation's best. So uh, to see these data in real time coming out of the clinic is a view that most of us will never have. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, now we have a pivot and no pressure for our next speaker, but we have uh, Dr. Christina Wayland, and she's joining us from the University of Michigan where uh, she oversees the education policy initiative at one of the uh, most well-regarded policy think tanks, the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. She's going to be talking about uh, childhood, early childhood interventions, and where we might be gaining some ground. Uh, Dr. Wayland, I'm going to turn it to you. Great. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the introduction. I am going to go through some of the problems, so I hope I'm <laughs> too much of a Debbie Downer um, for the conference. But um, I am going to be presenting what is really a joint work um, and collaboration. Uh, so um, a group of 16 academics and experts in early childhood education and um, 10 ECE policy and practice leaders who are the folks who've really been making the decisions in these large scale systems. We came together um, last year and summarized the evidence of across 15 months around what were the effects of uh, the crisis on young kids in early care and education programs. We see this really as a moment of both historic crisis and historic opportunity given that uh, the American Rescue Plan, for example, was the largest investment of public resources ever in early childhood in our country's history. And Build Back Better may be poised if that were to go forward with some of the early childhood components in it to really um, build out a system that our young kids and our families really deserve. Um, so with that long lead in, um, our other goal was to really help our policy and practice leaders around the country digest what was really an avalanche of evidence that was coming at them and to identify um, evidence-based solutions that they could actually use some of these new funds that were coming available to them to um, invest in. And that's where we will get to some of the um, kinds of solutions and recommendations that our team came up with. So just quickly, this is the, the research team, the 16 Dr. of us. Dr. Wayland, I'm just jumping in. Uh, your screen isn't shared. Oh, goodness, thank you. Uh, okay. Perfect. Okay, um, let me put it in presentation mode. Okay. So these, this is the authorship team. These are the researchers from around the country, um, different um, institutions, nonprofits, universities represented, and really um, the leaders in our field. Um, and these are policy and practice experts who I mentioned we had partnered with to make sure this was really grounded in the realities of what they were experiencing. So our review process was that we went through all of the evidence that was available uh, through May 2021 on the effects of early, uh, the crisis on early care and education in kids. We applied a set of quality criteria for uh, identifying the um, strongest of these studies, and that led us to 76 studies, 16 national, 45 from 31 states and 31 local states. This is all in a policy brief that's available um, on my center's website, the Education Policy Initiative, as well as to the Urban Institute. Um, and this map shows you where the evidence is coming from that we were summarizing. So these um, were for the kids, the effects on the kids. You can see a real range of states. The darker colors means we had at least two studies. Uh, the lighter blue is one study, white is none, and the orange is local studies. We also had 14 national studies. Um, so I'm going to give you the broad takeaways and then show you some of the findings that are um, behind this. So one of the big findings was that some of the necessary changes that were made to enhance safety weren't so conducive to learning and skill development. So there were 
teacher reports, for example, of doing things like instead of having kids learn together and work on their social, emotional, and sharing skills, that they were doing a lot more individual activities to limit content, uh, contact. Um, remote and hybrid learning, no surprise here, was really challenging, um, probably the most challenging for those with young children, less learning time and lower quality instruction. And even though most places are no longer primarily in this mode, this continues to be a concern for those short-term shut shutdowns and as well as for when kids are in quarantine. Um, we do have lots of evidence that children's learning and development did suffer setbacks during the crisis. We intentionally use the word setback and not learning loss because setback implies you can recover. Kids are resilient. If their investments are made in the right ways, they can come back. Um, and just like every other corner of the pandemic, early childhood is no exception. The effects of the crisis were not born equally. We really do have to center equity when we think about recovery um, and what the effects have been on different groups, particularly for children of color, dual language learners, um, children from families with low incomes. There were also kids who were missed in terms of identification of special needs um, and who didn't get the services that they needed to thrive and would have gotten otherwise um, in those critical early years. So this is a peek at some of the findings that are in the full report. So these are the enrollment drops that were reported around the country last year. And generally the pattern is the younger the kid, the, the more likely they were to have been in a different setting than they would have been otherwise. So you can see here things like in Colorado, infant enrollment was down by 42%. Um, it's a bit better in grades one through five. Our report does cover kids through age uh, seven. Um, and so there you see that uh, the drops are smaller. Um, the data that we do have on learning setbacks for kids primarily come from the early elementary grades, K-1-2. We have much less data on zero to five, but the kinds of things that you tend to see in the literature are that groups who are marginalized before the crisis began, like Black and Latino children um, in particular, are disproportionately um, impacted. So these are comparing the groups to themselves, to their cohorts, their counterparts before the crisis in meeting benchmarks in early reading. Um, so you can see that current cohorts are much more likely to have been struggling in reading, for example, in these critical early years uh, during the pandemic. Moving on to the effects on the programs and the workforce, and then I'll talk about some of our recommended solutions. Um, so we know that child care centers and family child care homes are much more effective than public schools and Head Start, where funding and supports were generally more steady and more reliable. The early stabilization uh, efforts that um, happened to get monies out to programs and support them. Um, there was some, some success in those, but there was a lot of unmet need, particularly in these child care homes and family child care homes with uh, recovery and even across the country. Uh, early childhood is always a, a hard job for teachers, but um, it got harder. Um, we see real impacts on teachers' mental health and that's adding up to essentially more challenging working conditions, financial concerns, and mental health struggles that are making it hard to find teachers and retain them. Um, this is a, some of the data that's available around the country on teachers' mental health in the crisis. And so, you know, we're pulling states that are quite different from each other, Massachusetts, Louisiana, Nebraska, um, and yet uh, whichever mental health um, data point you're looking at, there's a spike um, in depressive symptoms and stress. This is really nice data out of Virginia from Daphne Basuk's team at the University of Virginia. And this is before the pandemic, a sample of childcare teachers that were followed then after the pan during the pandemic. And you can see the spike. This isn't just about um, people uh, in a, who are stressed to begin with, it's about a real increase. Okay, so moving on to this more um, uh, evidence-backed equity-centered solutions place. So we took that and we talked with our policy partners and we said, okay, so what are the things that we know work in the educate in education um, that uh, could be brought to bear on some of these problems as you think about investing some of these additional funds? So um, in terms of addressing those setbacks, we, we do have ways to accelerate children's learning. The first one is to act on the best science of teaching and learning. So it's true that from zero to eight, we actually know a lot about how early uh, kids, how an early childhood kids learn best, but we don't do a great job of actually getting those programs implemented on the ground. So this represents a real opportunity to move to the curricula and professional development approaches for teachers that are more proven and let go the ones that are more popular, um, more likely to be implemented, but we actually know are less effective. 
uh, making the most of summer. So we need to think of summer as not just one summer of the pandemic, but multiple summers. Uh, we know that some summer programs are particularly successful at supporting um, young kids uh, and getting them ready for school or addressing their learning needs in the early years. Tutoring, um, so we know that tutoring works as early as kindergarten. And so some states like Tennessee, for example, have moved to actually implement this across the entire state. And so we have some districts that are really moving and states um, on this recommendation. And then hiring assistant teachers. So small groups work best for little kids versus whole groups. And so one way to do that is to have more assistant teachers in the room who can facilitate those. So even though there's a labor shortage, finding ways and creative ways to get more assistant teachers in the classroom, whether it be through partnerships with schools of education for um, students there uh, who can come in and help out um, to more creative hiring solutions, that that's a place to also uh, spend money. Um, supporting the whole child. So um, we also do have some proven socio-emotional curricula. So those are worthy um, of, of a real hard look for places that don't have them along with trauma-informed um, approaches. Um, we also had before the pandemic, um, harsh discipline problems in the early years, including in preschool with some kids expelled. And so uh, states that have moved in recent years to prohibit um, harsh discipline and preschool expulsion, that's another policy that's really important as we hear all over the country still that the kids who are back in front of them um, do have more challenging behaviors. Um, partnering with families. So there were some silver linings of the pandemic, one of which was um, teachers and families found new ways to connect virtually in ways that fit families' work schedules better. So that was actually something that enhanced equity that needs to continue um, and that many districts are moving to make that the policy that that's just as equally valid way and easy way to connect with your teacher as going in person. Uh, there are also tech-based interventions around the country um, that are now available. So the entire state of Illinois, for example, has implemented a texting program for parents that provide them with tips that just fit right into your day. Um, so some of these are also available for states and localities to um, get their, uh, the folks in their districts signed up. Okay, on the program side, we know and we've known for a very long time that we um, severely underpay our early educators. So, um, you know, our early educators pay a significant wage penalty compared to kindergarten teachers. In some places, you can make almost double if you teach kindergarten versus preschool. So um, moving towards living wage and parity policies is really important. DC is really leading the way. They've passed a ballot initiative and are moving towards pay parity for zero to three, not just preschool teachers. Um, and this is something where if Build Back Better passes, that would uh, could make a huge dent as well. Uh, equitable COVID testing access for ECE and K-12 settings. Something else that's happening is that uh, states have really prioritized getting additional tests and tests to stay type policies in place in K-12 settings and have neglected their early childhood settings, which is really disappointing considering that vaccines are not yet available to zero to five-year-olds. And so making equity across these sectors a priority is really, really important um, for keeping little kids in the classroom and in more stable environments. Um, and then if Build Back Better goes forward, there is really this opportunity that we've never had to expand publicly funded ECE programs to stabilize our child care providers and also invest in data systems and um, analytic capacity. That latter one can be done with current funding and some places are moving there. We just have a very, very hard time um, tracking um, who is even in which programs or how teachers move across them and the way that we do it as, as business as usual in K-12 in our systems. Finally, our team also did some thinking. This was really kind of rec uh, recommendations to um, researchers like ourselves as well as funders about the kind of research that's needed going forward. And so that included keeping track of what's going on in early childhood education, um, trying to learn from the impacts of new investments, particularly in ways that can look at causality. Um, so ways in which there may have been a cutoff um, that could be used to look at the causal effect of getting that subsidy versus not, for example. Uh, really prioritizing studying kids and families that were more affected in the crisis and for which there's very little evidence like homeless families, kids experiencing bereavement due to the pandemic, dual language learners, families with um, of children with disabilities. Uh, we also had a really hard time last year getting into the classroom. So we don't have great data 
uh, that like we usually do on things like what uh, classroom quality is really like, socio-emotional development of kids, directly assessed learning um, outcomes for the youngest children and staff and teacher training. We have standard ways that we measure these in early childhood, but they require that we're actually physically there with a little kid, <laughs> um, which is beginning to happen again this year, but it's still really, really tricky with the new variant and the spike in cases. And then finally, um, prioritizing collecting systematic data on the workforce. We have teachers uh, leaving the sector left and right, and so being able to track them is another um, important priority going forward. Okay, so I wanna thank my team um, who supported us as well as our Heising Simon, which uh, supported our consensus work. Dr. Wayland, Christina, uh, thank you so much. And the, your point about the vulnerability of teachers is we could build a really important conference uh, around just that. And uh, thanks for the call to action in so many ways for younger kids and support of equity in education and uh, these issues that, that all of our presenters, panelists, and audience members are all stakeholders too. So that's so keen and really appreciate that. Uh, your point about changing to uh, the kinds of technologies that make care more accessible is a great segue to our next presenter, Dr. Ben Locke, who is now the Chief Clinical Officer at Together All, which is an online community. Uh, Dr. Locke, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you. Um, hopefully somebody will confirm for me that my screen is shared. Got it. Yep. Can we confirm that? Fantastic. All right. So um, this is about mental health in college. And um, I'm Chief Clinical Officer at uh, Together All. I'm a little bit of a pinch hitter today, coming in at the last minute to, to offer this perspective. Um, I've spent about 25 years in mental health and about 20 years in college. And before my current role, sort of working at population levels, I started a research center called the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. So I will, oops, there we go. I will, uh, I've provided a bunch of resources here on this first slide for CCMH, which I will reference in a couple different spots. And then also some references for my current role with Together All. Um, just with CCMH, their 2021 annual report, actually the last report I worked on uh, was just released this week. Sorry, my keyboard's skipping around there. So that's available at Reports. There's a five-part series on COVID uh, in the blog area. The Clinical Load Index is a tool that is used to grade institutions by their mental health staffing uh, and, and compare them, which is a great interactive tool. And then the Data Navigator, if you're interested in looking at um, detail about college student mental health, there's 1.6 million students in treatment represented in that database. And for me, that's about 17 years worth of research uh, that you can dive in and, and take a peek there. Uh, and of course, the Together All website and a case study of how peer-to-peer uh, -peer clinically managed uh, support systems can help support at the population level. So before COVID, uh, it almost seems hard to remember at this point, but I was a director of a very large uh, counseling center uh, and a statewide system of mental health services. And many people referred to it as a crisis. We you know we're in a crisis of mental health at that time. Um, I actually viewed it pretty differently. Uh, I think we were looking at 20 years of effort and billions and billions of investment at state, federal, and private level, uh, private um, level investments to reduce stigma, increase help seeking, and train community members. All of the, 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 the common and shared purpose across all of those was to identify and refer those in need of service. Um, and a really good example of the origin of that is the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act, uh, passed in 2004, funded in 2005. Um, so think about it for a minute. We spent two decades and billions of dollars trying to increase the rate at which people were identified and referred to service but we never actually scaled any mental health services to match the anticipated outcomes of those uh, investments. So what we ended up with pre-COVID was a scarcity of treatment, 
natural consequence of that uh, balance of activities. That produced a scarcity mindset in the population. And then the fans of that were further flamed through what I call the crisis narrative. Um, what we were experiencing pre-COVID was primarily, although there's many, many, many components to mental health uh, trends and dynamics, but a crisis of treatment capacity caused by uh, increasing demand without growing your supply. We didn't have a general mental health crisis fall out of the sky on a rainy day. It took two decades to produce the level of demand that we were seeing. And it's really important um, for those critical thinkers out there to take a really careful look at the data. When you see articles about you know, crisis in mental health, look at the data. I'll give you one quick example, and you can pick just about any CCMH in a report to dig into this. One of the data points we ask of students when they come in seeking mental health services is and what or was and is, um, in the last two weeks, have you had thoughts of ending your life? Of students coming to counseling centers across hundreds of thousands of students, millions of students across hundreds of centers and institutions, about 40% of students endorse that greater than zero. Think about that. 40% of students seeking services say they have had thoughts of ending their life. That fits right into the crisis narrative. Um, however, when you look at the data that the clinicians provide after they have sat with a student, done a careful professional evaluation, and then determined what the presenting concerns are, the prevalence of uh, suicidality as a presenting concern drops to below 10%. So from those two data points, you see a 75% relative reduction in the prevalence of suicidal ideation. So when we talk about mental health services, needs, the crisis narrative, how you frame it, we really need to put on our critical thinking hats and look carefully at the data. What we know is that mental health treatment works across the board, regardless of your approach. Um, the challenge is it's increasingly hard to get, and what you receive is typically much shorter in duration than it used to be. Um, and often much more regimented in the way it's delivered. Um, the other piece that we saw prior to COVID was that mental health jargon had become fully integrated into the way that we talk in our culture. So whereas you used to have butterflies in your stomach, now you might be referred to as having a public speaking phobia. Um, where you used to feel sad following a breakup, now you have adjustment disorder with depression. So there are very real questions about where the lines exist between normative human distress and a mental health problem or mental illness. Uh, and they become quite blurred. And this was all prior to COVID. Uh, also prior to COVID, most schools were leaning towards a focus on broad uh, wellness while also coping with how do we grow treatment. Okay, during COVID, um, so I was a director at Penn State at that time. Um, in about two weeks, we went through five years of change, probably. Overnight, we became a teleservice. Um, and this was a profound international event, but certainly in college. Usage patterns changed dramatically. We saw nationally at all ages of, of help seeking uh, an increase in demand for services, but combined with dramatic uh, workforce disruption from parents being, uh, I'm sorry, clinicians being unable to work for all kinds of reasons, including being sick or being parents, um, as well as people leaving the field. Um, just pervasive stress and mental health changes that I won't go into today, but I do welcome you to look at the CCMH blog if you're interested in understanding some of those details. Um, there were numerous challenges posed to status quo ways of thinking about mental health service delivery. For example, state-by-state state licensing restrictions where I, as a psychologist, can't treat somebody in another state. Those were often put on pause during COVID, but then those uh, restrictions went back in place. And at the same time, we saw the rise of teleservice companies, telemental health companies, which had been uh, kind of preparing for their debut for about 10 years, but they came rushing onto the scene to, to help meet this demand. Really important thing to take a look there, and there's a blog post at CCMH about this, is that if you look at the exclusion criteria of many telehealth companies, about 60% of students seeking mental health services conservatively would be excluded based on certain characteristics from being eligible for teleservices. There were uh, 
too many dynamics to talk about in college, but a couple of things worth noting is that some of the most dire predictions did not come true. So actually utilization in college and university counseling centers dropped by an average of 30%. Suicide rates decreased uh, in college. And even in Canada, they recently had a, a interesting report released where they observed the same pattern during this time. That doesn't jive with the general experience of increased stress and distress and, and anxiety, uh, but it has been found. The biggest increase across the board observed in mental health treatment centers in higher education was in academic distress, students' ability to function in a remote academic environment. It's really interesting to note um, <clears throat> that during COVID, there was uh, in, in higher education, there was this average 30% reduction in uh, utilization, but those who did come in and seek services received an average of 20% more treatment. Uh, and this just really proves the point that caseloads matter. When you have huge caseloads, you can't give each person really what they need. So uh, we had a lot of swirling questions as we came back to campus. Now that uh, students are back on campus, Demand routinely exceeds pre-pandemic levels, just as we thought that it would. Um, there continues to be a massive disruption in the workforce. Uh, some folks are calling the great resignation, but in mental health, in college, we're seeing enormous difficulties re, uh, retaining current staff and leadership, but also just simply recruiting new folks. Uh, college counseling is not uh, in the, uh, viewed the same way uh, as a workplace destination that it used to be, partly because of all the stress and crisis shift that we've been seeing. Uh, as we move ahead into the future, I think institutions are increasingly going to be held accountable for how they choose to fund their mental health services. The clinical load index referenced on my first slide is a great tool for understanding how that works. And I think institutions are going to continue to move towards a broad uh, wellness umbrella approach to thinking about mental health. But my hope is that folks are also gonna begin thinking about flipping the stepped care model towards population level services as a, as a first step, um, and then gradually working down to treatment that can be afforded. And then looking ahead, uh, you know, will state level licensing be retained in the way that it is, or will we open up uh, the ability for providers to function nationally that would attend to market disruption, demand supply and balance, those kinds of things. And I will stop there because I know we're running a little behind today, but thank you very much. It's great to be with you and have a chance to pinch hit here. Dr. Locke, Ben, thank you so much. In, uh, I almost feel like with you and Christina that I should apologize uh, uh, after the fact for introducing you as being the pivot to good news. <laughs> especially because uh, the data from college campuses are just so grim. And uh, certainly all of us working here know that to be the experience of students. Uh, so thank you for sharing that remarkable expertise and all of those resources. And uh, like Kareem said, we'll compile all those and make them available to all of our uh, attendees and presenter colleagues. So thank you for that. Uh, I am now definitely pivoting into the what's working space with one of my favorite colleagues in the world, uh, Phil Tedeschi, Philip Tedeschi. Uh, Phil is joined by two of my favorite students, two of my favorite graduate students, Maddie Pontius, uh, and we've got, and Julia Rosenzweig. I think Julia is here too. I just don't see her on my screen yet, but uh, we've invited them to talk about a program that is really remarkable here at the University of Denver, but uh, Phil's expertise lies in the application of animal assisted interventions to promote well being and his expertise is global in this area and uh, I always describe him as a feather in the cap of the University of Denver and uh, frankly the country so uh, Phil thank you for sharing uh, a bit of bright spot, if only to show uh, Samara's face in the background. So thank you. Thank you, yeah, well, whenever, wherever Samara goes, it's always, it's always good news. So thank you, Kim. Um, well, you know, thanks for inviting us to present at the STAT conference. I wanna, you know, give my applause to really everyone at DU who has been champions during this extremely challenging time and uh, you know, it's just been amazing to watch and, and it's really humbling just to be a, 
small part of that. Uh, I'm a clinical professor at the Graduate School of Social Work. And for most of my time there, I've been the executive director of the Institute for Human Animal Connection. I just stepped down out of that role in June and will be returning as a director emeritus and returning to the faculty uh, starting in now, really. Um, I'm teaching this spring, so I'm excited to be back. Uh, and I wanted to start by just telling you that about two years ago, I, I edited and published a book with a colleague called Transforming Trauma, Resiliency and Healing Through Our Connection with Animals. Uh, I also teach a course called the Canine Assisted Intervention Specialist. Uh, and that is both of those endeavors uh, and inquiries brought me to recognize that uh, dogs in particular, although there are other animals that are, are, are very therapeutic, but dogs in particular play an outsized role in this regard, um, that uh, dogs were being incorporated in many complex clinical environments. Uh, just to name a couple of those, you know, one is that's obvious uh, to most of us who are uh, in university environments is the role that dogs might play in stress relief. Um, so we might, might see them, for example, in the library during exam times. But maybe more intensively, we've started to see dogs work, working in with chronically mentally ill homeless persons, in prisons, in child maltreatment environments, in crisis response places like school shootings, um, and many other settings, even, place, even things like uh, the fires that have just recently happened often in deep, uh, debriefing and doing crisis response, we'll see therapeutic dogs involved in those settings. So when, uh, you know, when, when the University of Denver was starting to uh, experience this significant uh, role in, you know, managing and supporting student mental health, in particular related to issues where that student was isolated uh, and feeling alone, you know, involved in let's say the quarantine environment, we really saw some, some opportunity to employ uh, this particular intervention approach. So probably the, the science behind this, and I won't go into it much, and I'm gonna turn it over here to my graduate student colleagues who really have been doing the uh, on the ground work in this area, but really one of the most important areas is that our capacity to measure biomarkers and examine the interpersonal neurobiology of how a safe or appropriate dog can alter somebody's neurological functioning has, is, is really at the heart of much of this particular uh, intervention. And as we know, uh, we were dealing with a lot of those mental health challenges on campus. So with that, I'm gonna transfer you to uh, one of the graduate students, Maddie, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you tell people how this actually worked. Perfect. Um, hi, y'all. Like Phil said, my name is Maddie. I am a student at the Graduate School of Professional Psychology, um, and I'm the team lead for our student health and wellness ambassador team here at DU. Um, our multidisciplinary team is made up of graduate student clinicians from different schools and specialties here, from forensic psychology to counseling psychology to social work and even research methods. Um, and as y'all have all heard today, the social scientists have played a huge role in living through this pandemic and managing COVID related distress as we've all experienced at one point or another. And the place where this has been especially apparent for us is on college campuses. Um, we're transitioning to college is difficult enough and dealing with the daily stressors of just being in school can be a challenge. And then when you add a global pandemic on top of that, there can be a lot of feelings of extreme loneliness, confusion, fear, even feeling trapped. And unfortunately the social distancing and isolating that's necessary to keep students and faculty and staff safe and healthy on college campuses can worsen those feelings and the mental toll and emotional isolation that COVID is having on students started to get really dangerous really fast. So that's where our student health and wellness ambassador team comes in. Um, our role is to triage students who've been exposed to COVID or who have tested positive for COVID to assess for their mental health needs 
and then provide the appropriate support ourselves or make referrals to DU's mental health services for ongoing treatment. So we text, call, email, Zoom, every student who's in a screening period, in quarantine or in isolation. Um, and then it's kind of up to them if they want to engage with our team or not. But it could be the littlest thing like asking a question about when their next free test date is, or it could be the biggest thing like doing a quick safety assessment over the phone with a student who's thinking about self-harm. But generally what we've been seeing is most students are just really glad to have someone who understands to listen to them since our team is all made up of students as well and someone who can check in on them and just help them feel heard and seen. And I think this makes everything feel a little less lonely and a little more manageable. Um, so our team has been going strong at DU for just over a year now. As you can see here in this photo, we have a few honorary team members, Bagel and Ruby, um, who play with our human team members and other DU community members as well. Um, and so thanks to Phil and Julia, we've been able to kind of expand our support with the work we're doing to include comfort dogs to further support um, students on campus in improving their mental health. And you can take it away, Julia. Thanks. So a quick look into why dogs. Um, a dog doesn't view you through an oppressive lens or with the intolerance that a human being um, that human beings have the capability to apply to one another in many cases. They have the ability to help someone that might be feeling stuck, unseen, or alone because a dog doesn't judge. Interacting with or even just witnessing a dog is a wonderful cognitive behavioral intervention because it is able to alter somebody's perceptions about their circumstances. Um, an example might be if a student feels hopeless, this interaction with the dog can demonstrate a relaxed, happy-go-lucky perspective and help that struggling person gain a new perspective or ease their pain. Um, with this, we intentionally tried to alter that oxytocin system that gives someone access to be able to regulate, be more optimistic, feel safer, and more sociable, which I have seen in several students that have participated in comfort dogs. That's been really cool. Um, so a little bit about comfort dogs. We initially developed this program to support the mental health of students going through quarantine and screening during COVID, but quickly realized it also benefits students as well as faculty that are struggling to transition to college, have testing anxiety, miss their own dogs, experience trauma. It's endless possibilities as to why dogs can be helpful. Each week, there were many new faces, as well as some consistent visitors that come to pet the dogs and just talk. When we were posted outside of the library, countless students stated that they were relieved from the stress of schoolwork upon interacting with the dogs. When posted outside of one of the COVID testing labs, there was actually a person that was so grateful for the comfort of the dogs while completing their spit test because they mentioned they found spitting repulsive and they were having extreme anxiety surrounding doing this weekly. So just seeing the dog was a real um, stress reliever. And lastly, the dog sparked conversation that usually started with how much the person misses their dogs back home. Um, then it would be like, where is home? And sometimes it would even lead them to revealing anxieties or struggles they were having. And that's all for comfort dogs. Julia, Maddie, thank you. Uh, uh, I'll just say this is completely shameless. Uh, the COVID team here had the, uh, uh, the idea to mobilize our workforce of graduate student clinicians to address the psychosocial needs of our students in isolation and quarantine. Uh, we were inspired by a student ambassador program at the University of Illinois, which we highlighted at the STAT conference last year. So if you wondered if any of the ideas we share here today have real world impact, this is a great example of uh, the kind of inspiration being applied for uh, public good. Uh, importantly, my colleague Phil and I uh, brainstormed ways to uh, add a, a well-being component to it and the um, uh, comfort dogs 
program was born and uh, it's a credit to the student clinicians that I supervise on that team and to uh, Phil's really robust commitment to um, improving the lives of people using uh, dogs in this case. So thank you to this group. Y'all were you, uh, near and dear to my heart and I really appreciate you. Uh, finally, I can say uh, that you may never have felt as inspired as you will feel by listening to our final speaker of session one. Uh, this is, I think, uh, a celebrity moment for a lot of us. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Carl Clark. He's president and CEO of MHCB. He's a national spokesperson for resiliency and the application of psychology to promote well-being across the lifespan, to promote recovery. Uh, so all of the promises I've made about uh, the program taking an upturn. Thank you to Phil for uh, adding animals to the program. Uh, Dr. Clark will finish this out on a real high note. So I turn it to you, my friend. Thank you. All right. So I don't need to see myself. Does anybody else see me? Um, Let's see. I don't see you. Do you hear me? I do hear you. Well, it says my video is on, but I don't see anything. So I let me I see you on the screen. We did see your screenshot of uh, you were probably mountain biking on a 14er or yeah, so well, you know, it, whether you can see me or not, I can talk. How about that? You know, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to be the last thing between somebody's break. So um, I am Dr. Carl Clark. I'm a psychiatrist. I run the Mental Health Center of Denver, and we power the pursuit of well-being. That's really what we're all about. And so when staff members come to work for us, we have them do Strengths Finder, which is looking at kind of the top five things that you're sort of naturally good at. And we focus on that because we know if you're naturally good at something, you can be great um, at those things. And this pandemic truly has impacted the well being of everyone. Um, and we've seen it across the board. The need for services has gone up. And I would say that thing that we used to have between us and them when it came to mental health has kind of disappeared. I probably had more um, requests by businesses about what to do for their staff um, during the pand pandemic, especially around stress and what they could do for their well being. So, this mental health thing is really becoming the second pandemic. Um, there was a bit of a lag, but the demand for services has really sky skyrocketed. Prior to the pandemic, one in five people were dealing either with a mental health issue or um, with uh, a substance use disorder. And out of those people who needed help, only two out of five were getting the help that they needed. There are a lot of things that contribute to that. And it's often people don't know how to access care, or maybe they are reluctant to start care. So what mental health centers do, and we're the mental health center in Denver, we kind of do three basic things. We do things for the body to help the mind, so somatic treatments. So that might be medication, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, it might be helping people eat better, get exercise, good sleep, all those things that we can do with the body that can help the mind. The second thing we do are the psychotherapies. And clearly our brains do lots of things, but the three biggies are we think, we feel, and we do stuff. That's what psychotherapies are, uh, are about. Uh, people can have trouble in any one of those areas, and psychotherapy is really about helping people um, when they have trouble with any of those. The third thing that we do are actually social determinants of health, which frankly have a bigger impact on people's overall health care than anything anybody does clinically, regardless of the discipline. So uh, having a place to live um, impacts your health. So we help people with affordable housing. We actually develop affordable housing, helping people go back to school, helping people go back to work. These things have a huge impact on people's overall health. So when I say mental health, it's interesting because people think mental illness, right? 
But if you think about it, we all have mental health and we're somewhere on a continuum. So some people are doing just fine. Some people are thriving. Um, and I, I appreciate the earlier comments about where's that line between, you know, just not okay to actually having an illness. Uh, when we're experiencing stress, trauma, a variety of things, uh, things can start to go awry. Sometimes it results in illness. The good news is, is that most people can and do recover from their illness. Now, we certainly have people that um, have uh, very serious and persistent mental illnesses. And as a society, it's our uh, opportunity to help protect and guard folks and make sure that they have access to things that will be helpful to them. So our doors are wide open. So we see about 20,000 people a year, all age groups, young kids to the elderly, and we do it in very different ways. Um, prior to the pandemic, a lot of people came to our clinics. Uh, we pivoted uh, just like everyone else did in a very rapid period of time. We had it on our strategic plan to do more telehealth. And we were gonna roll that out over the course of the year. We rolled it out over the course of 38 hours. And as a psychiatrist, I can say that um, I had an experience I never had uh, with telehealth, which is 100% of the people that were on my schedule showed up. That has never happened in my career. My schedule is always a guess at who might show up that day. So for many people actually, um, telehealth, whether it's video or telephone, has increased their ability to access care. People don't have to worry about transportation or childcare issues, those sorts of things. So one model we have is people coming to us. The other is our placing people in the community where people are already naturally going. So that's like childcare facilities and nursing homes and other community-based organizations where if there's a need and we can figure out a way to do it, we place our folks there. So um, our newest model is actually going into the community. So we have our co-responder program. You know, illnesses are not crimes. So that's where a licensed social worker with a police officer goes on a call where they think there might be a behavioral health issue and, and do interventions. And I can tell you before we had our co-responder program, 97% of those people would wind up in jail. Um, and after we put the program in place, only 7% wind up getting arrested. So people are actually accessing care. And then our very newest program is our STAR program. And that's where some 911 calls actually come directly to us. They're screened by 911. So these are calls that don't need lights and sirens, that sort of thing. And uh, we send out a paramedic and a licensed social worker in a van in plain clothes, and they um, do the interventions that folks need. And a lot of times when people call 911, it is actually a social crisis. So we help people connect with the services um, that they need. So um, oftentimes people are wondering, well, how, how do we access care? So during the pandemic, we did launch our app, the MHCD app, so that people have a digital front door to be able to access care. And what it has with that is a new website that we're offering uh, to the community. It's called You at Your Best. And You at Your Best is curated content. We were doing human-centered design, this is prior to the pandemic, with young people and sort of finding out what needs were and how they wanted to access care. And they said, it's really simple. You know, if I'm depressed, I can Google depression and I get 1 million things. What I really need is the good stuff. They wanted curated content. So you at your best.com is just that, it's curated content. Any of you can go and uh, experience the website. You can look at how are you doing with your health, how are you doing in your career or your community, and the content is curated for you. If you sign up into the website, the content gets more specific. I can't see the audience, you can't see me, but what I know is, is that we're all very different people, and based on who we identify as, the content can be specialized for somebody just like you. And then if somebody needs more than that, they can all, always connect with treatment. 
So what I do have is a resource guide that I will drop into um, the um, into the chat. And the resource guide is ways to access care. So we have, if you're here in Denver at Colfax in Claremont, we have a walk-in clinic that's open 24 seven. If you have a friend or family member or a need, just go there, you know, everyone is welcome. There is a statewide crisis line. And one of the things that I wish they had not done is call it a crisis line because people often talk themselves out of getting services. There's sort of, well, I'm depressed, but am I in crisis? I say, if you're a little bit worried, call the crisis line. They really know how to connect people with services. Um, in, the, in the handout, you'll see a, a course from Yale that's the science of well-being taught by Dr. Lori Santos, a psychologist. It's taking what we know from the field of positive psychology and what goes right with the brain. It's a 10-week course. It's online for free. It's very easy to take. It's all about your personal well-being. I'm sure your well-being is good. My well-being is good. Mine was measurably better after I took the course, and partly because there are things that we do in our lives that contribute to our well-being. You learn the science behind it, which gives you the opportunity to start doing more. And one other thing for folks in the community is mental health first aid. This is a program that we brought from Australia, and it's helping just people um, that are in the community have the tools to know what to do if they have a friend or a family member that needs to access care. So I never like to be between people in their break. So um, with that, Kim, I'll say that's it. Dr. Clark, thank you so much. Uh, there's uh, such a rich compilation of resources there at the URL that you've shared. We'll make sure that uh, that and um, all of the MHCB materials get circulated. Uh, I, I know that we're standing between you and a meeting with the mayor. So thank you for being so gracious with your time as we ran a few minutes over into our break. Um, I really want to extend the most heartfelt gratitude to Drs. Clark, Wyland, Locke, Tavy, uh, also to Phil, Maddie, and Julia on the Shawa team. Uh, this year, we were really committed to showcasing the important work of uh, social science, behavioral health in uh, both documenting the impact of COVID and pandemic, but also in informing the ways that we might move on from here. So we're going to take a three minute break. We're launching live at 10 after three with our more traditional sciences. So we'll talk about the view of the future from pandemic to endemic and something about what the virus might look like uh, uh, 10 months from now to 10 years from now. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, get hydrated, take a break, do a mindfulness meditative exercise uh, and we know that your brain and body will thank you and we'll see you in just a few minutes. Thanks so much. <laughs>